It's tremendously great to be here. Um, and as you can tell from the news, especially since the beginning of the year in Northern Africa, we have a major opportunity in the world to redefine the relationship with Islam. But what direction should we go? How should we think about the relationship, especially of the United States and the West, to Islam in the world? Well, we've been doing some research at the University of Chicago that I think will help put some of these questions into better context. I study suicide terrorism. Why suicide terrorism? Suicide terrorism is the lung cancer of terrorism. The average suicide attack kills 12 times as many compared to the average ordinary terrorist attack. Without the element of suicide, the 9-11 hijackers could never have killed 3,000 people. How do we know that? In 1993, there was an ordinary terrorist attack against the very same World Trade Center uh, where uh, terrorists put a truck bomb under the t uh, in a garage, tried to fell one of the towers, killed six people. Well, we certainly didn't turn our country upside down over that terrorist attack in 1993. We didn't turn our foreign policy upside down over that ordinary terrorist attack. In other words, the threat, the real problem that we face is not just simply terrorism, but specifically suicide terrorism. And unless we understand better the root cause of suicide terrorism, we're likely not to get the problem right. Now, for a number of years, I've been doing research on suicide terrorism. I'm the person that published the first complete database of all suicide terrorist attacks around the world. I did this as part of an academic article in 2003. When I published that database, I knew then that no academic, no think tank had such a database. What I didn't know is that no government had such a database either. I was quickly contacted by our Department of Defense. And I'm going to emphasize this again and again because the Department of Defense, yes, the Donald Rumsfeld Department of Defense, was actually one of the big funders of this study that you're about to see. And that's important because you're going to see that this runs very counter to the policies of the Bush administration. And nonetheless, they were one of the major funders from the beginning of this study. So too has been the Navy. So too has been um, uh, foundations such as the Carnegie Corporation in New York, um, also Argonne National Laboratories, and the University of Chicago itself. Because what this generous funding has made it possible for me to do is to become, as you'll see, the uh, leader of a project called the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism, uh, which collects information about suicide attacks all around the world. But the way to think about it is what we do is collect information the way a medical researcher would collect information on lung cancer. We treat suicide terrorism just like lung cancer. And we want to know who gets it and who doesn't get it to better understand the root causes of the problem. We're not starting from Republican principles or Democratic principles. We're not starting from Muslim principles or Christian principles. We're just looking at data. That's what we are doing, just looking at data to find out who gets it and who doesn't get it. Now, that um, funding, and I'll be telling you more about this, uh, led to two books you heard in the introduction. This is now the second book I've published on the subject. First book came out in 2005, and then as you'll see, suicide terrorism continued, so we had to have more <laughs> to say, um, and there's a lot more to say. Uh, and um, uh, the new book came out last fall. Now, before I get into the details of this, though, I want to talk to you about um, what happened when that last book came out in the fall. The launch for that book was on Capitol Hill. We had an all-day conference on October 12th on Capitol Hill from 9 in the morning until 5 at night with some very prominent people, uh, the heads of the 9-11 Commission. Okay? They've endorsed the book. If you ever get a chance to ever see a copy of the book, you'll see they've endorsed it on the back of the book. That's extremely important to know. Um, other people, such as Peter Bergen, you've seen him on CNN, they came to our conference. We were introduced by congressmen. Um, uh, in fact, uh, just, you might be interested to know, just last week I was back on Capitol Hill again because a donor, uh, this time a Republican, um, actually the CEO of an energy company, figure that one out, especially when you hear the argument, <laughs> um, he bought a thousand copies of the book. 
a thousand copies of the book, gave them to every member of Congress and the staff, and we had an hour and a half session on Capitol Hill. Um, the most important thing, though, that happened that day on October 12th was the talk by Admiral Gary Ruffhead. Admiral Gary Ruffhead is the chief of naval operations, the current chief of naval operations. He's the boss of the Navy. The Navy has 350,000 people. He's the number one officer in the Navy. He came to talk, and the name of his talk was The Role of the Navy in Offshore Balancing. That's important because, as you're going to hear, offshore balancing is the policy that comes out of this research. And he announced at that conference that offshore balancing would be the future policy of the Navy going forward. Uh, that is on uh, uh, a YouTube video on C-SPAN uh, as we're videotaping this. Everything nowadays doesn't count unless it's on video. It actually doesn't. It's funny because it doesn't matter whether it's in print now. It has to be on video. <laughs> and so Admiral Ruffhead's uh, uh, talk, uh, you can just go to YouTube and look at it. And this is really quite important because where's that coming from? That's not coming from President Obama. It's not even coming from the Secretary of Defense. That's coming from the data, the research. So what's important about what you're about to hear today is the data. And why is it the case that these important people, again, you know, running the Navy, that's a budget of just $200 billion a year, just to put this in some context, okay? Think about what this is. Why would they get interested in this? Not because of the bottom lines. In fact, you're gonna, the bottom lines would tend to push them away. The question here is the data, the confidence in the data. And that's where, even before I start talking about bottom lines, I want to start to tell you a bit more about the data. Because just like the admiral staff, just like senator staff, just like congressman staff, you're going to find yourself asking the question, how good is the data? Very important issue. We live in an internet age, a lot of garbage on the internet. How good is this data? Well, let's start there. So if you go to our website, the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism web website. Uh, I want to show you the data, much of which we've put on the web. Now, of course, you'll see we're still very proud of our Capitol Hill conference. I uh, hope you'll forgive us. This was the first conference ever for the University of Chicago on Capitol Hill. Um, this is really quite a big deal because you can't buy a conference on Capitol Hill. You have to have members of Congress support you to give a conference on Capitol Hill. And so it's really quite a uh, thing that we're, we're proud of. But anyway, let's go to the database. And again, if you go online, um, first of all, you'll see our people page. Um, well, we don't just collect information, lists of lists. Uh, we actually do native language research in addition to English. We collect all the information that we can find all around the world, not just in English, but in native languages associated with this phenomenon. Arabic, Hebrew, Tamil, Russian, Urdu. This gives you a sense of our uh, of our people. Um, we also don't just sit in computers <laughs> and desks in Chicago and do this. Um, we um, send people to buy things basically on black markets in Cairo, Damascus, Beirut. Uh, we are not, again, just a list of lists. We are the primary source of this information as you're going to see. So this is just the, this is, we believe, the world's best collection of information um, on suicide terrorism that there is. Now, to show it to you, let me go to our online database, um, and you'll, um, uh, you'll see that, um, uh, how easy it is to use. And you'll see our data begins in the early 1980s. That's when the modern phenomenon really begins. And if we search by location, I'm going to pick Lebanon, because you're all familiar with Hezbollah, the famous suicide terrorist group. And let me just search Lebanon here. And you'll see, oh, there are 38 suicide attacks, and you see some general statistics. But again, how good is the data? And you will find yourself asking this question over and over as we go further into this. Well, at the bottom, since uh, 1980, 1981? Yeah, yeah, that's when the modern phenomenon begins, sir. Uh, and it's okay to ask quick questions like that. That doesn't bother me whatsoever. Um, and it's because um, we have looked very hard uh, in the years before that, it does not seem to exist. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second, but let me again get into the quality of the database. So you see that we've given you a list of attacks, no surprise so far, and we can go to view details for the first attack. 
And here on the card, right away you see, oh, okay, not just information on the date of the attacker number killed, but very specific information, often the name of the suicide attacker, socioeconomic data about the suicide attacker. We have this level of information for over 2,200 suicide attacks. That's just one card. <laughs> okay, on our database, we have over 2,200 suicide attacks. But again, this is still just a summary. How good is the data? At the bottom, you see sources that look like footnotes. Each and every bit of data you're going to see me talk about today has been corroborated by a minimum of two independent sources of data. And often, we have four and five sources of data for every bit of information you're about to see. But again, I'm just still just asserting that. Well, if you go to the sources, you can see view source. And we put online for free the actual textual source of each and every one of those sources so that you could verify this for yourself. Or if you have a staff like the Admiral's staff, you can say, here are 25 people, go spend a week, try to break the database. <laughs> see what's in there that's not, shouldn't be in there, see what's missing, dot, dot, dot. We make that this isn't a verifiable database, this is a verified database. And this is a very important thing to happen, and it's very important to do this work at a university uh, setting, um, because those of you who are not familiar with the differences between a university and a think tank in Washington, think tanks in Washington live off of soft money. That means they need new funding year after year. That means they want to sell their data over and over and over again. Once you put this online for free, I cannot go and sell the data. <laughs> you see what I mean? Um, and that's very, very important because that means that there is a public dissemination aspect to what we're doing at the university that's really not replicable really outside of a university. Um, and we have over 10,000 documents on the web for free to verify the database. Now we have made it uh, difficult for you to simply download everything and try to sell it yourself. <laughs> okay, so we haven't made it uh, so easy to steal. Um, but the fact of the matter is, this is why people are having real confidence in what, uh, what the findings are. Not just simply because of the findings, but because there's real confidence underneath this that this is actually quite excellent data. Now, what does the database show? I want to talk to you about the database in two parts. First, the world of suicide terrorism around the world from 1980 to 2003. Think about that as suicide um, uh, terrorism before the Iraq War, and then from 2004 on. Think about that as the world of suicide terrorism after the Iraq War. Well, from 1980 to 2003, there were 343 completed suicide terrorist attacks defined in the classic sense you would expect when I use that term of an individual killing himself, himself, or herself, herself on a mission to kill others. That's what we're tracking. That's classic definition. The world leader during this period is not, and I want to score, not an Islamic group. They're the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka a Marxist group, a secular group, a Hindu group. The Tamils in Sri Lanka did more suicide attacks than Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Further, at least a third of all Muslim suicide attacks are by purely secular groups, such as the PKK in Turkey, which is another Marxist, read, anti-religious suicide terrorist group. Notice over 50% are not associated with Islamic fundamentalism. Now think about that for a moment. What do most people think is driving suicide terrorism? Religion. Any older religion? No. <laughs> Islamic fundamentalism. It doesn't hold up, ladies and gentlemen. It simply doesn't hold up. The facts don't fit.